So, good afternoon, everyone. How are you enjoying this summit so far? Like it? Yeah. Excellent. My name is Ioannis. I'm a partner solutions architect here at Databricks. And uh, with my colleague, Hemal, we are going to discuss how you can simplify networking and enhance data security on your Databricks workspaces on AWS, thanks to Private Link. So, what is Private Link? Why is it relevant for Databricks? And why should you care? Let's start by reviewing how Databricks workspace is deployed on AWS. As you may already know, Databricks follows a deployment model where the customer's data reside in AS3 buckets of the customer's AWS account. The Spark clusters that process this data are deployed, in, uh, are deployed by Databricks in a VPC, again on the customer's AWS account. While the Databricks web app, which is the entry point uh, for a user to Databricks, as well as cluster management and a few other services, they all run on a Databricks AWS account. And as you can see from this diagram, the all network connections between the data plane and the control plane are initiated by the Spark clusters. That is, for a cluster to be managed by the control plane, it is the cluster that needs to initiate the connection. So even if the IP addresses of the control plane services are public, the cluster, uh, the cluster nodes are in subnets with private IP addresses, and they cannot be reached from outside the VPC. And moreover, as both the control plane and the data plane are staying in the same AWS region, network traffic between the control plane and data plane never leaves, never leaves the internal AWS backbone, making the network infrastructure itself as, 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 as secure as possible. Now, uh, many customers have requested that um, all these network configuration connect, all, all these network uh, connections can become private. And why is that? Now, first of all, when a user with a public IP address connects to Databricks workspace, now, this user, in principle, may obtain a copy of some data and link it to the internet. And in fact, data exfiltration is the number one reason why customers have asked for us to implement private link. Now, at the same time, there have been also concerns about these other connections that would like actually to be private, become private as well. And the reason for that is that in order for the Spark cluster to access a destination with a public IP address, such as, for example, the control plane or the S3 service, right? The VPC needs to be equipped with a NAT and an internet gateway. And the risk here is that unless you have set up some kind of a network firewall that will limit the network traffic to just these services, data can be sent to the internet without even crossing the control plane or the user's computer. So, so the need for the NAT and the internet gateway may potentially present a risk of data exfiltration, but also it means that you have increased costs because of NAT and data egress, while in some organizations, uh, traffic to public IP addresses is simply out of question uh, due to compliance requirements. So how can we make networking configuration simpler, cheaper, and at the same time, enhance data security? It turns out, actually, the VPC endpoints uh, based on private link can provide a really elegant solution here. Now, let us first examine this connection between the cluster and the S3 service. Now, several years ago, AWS received feedback from their customers who had virtual machines accessing data in S3 buckets in the same region. And they claim that in this scenario, if the data resides on disks in the same data center where the VMs are running, why route traffic over the internet when it can stay on the AWS backbone? So AWS introduced VPC endpoints for accessing these S3 buckets in the same region. And with these endpoints, the traffic to the public IP addresses of these buckets is not going through the internet gateway, but rather a service-specific gateway remaining always on the AWS backbone, right? This is what they called the gateway uh, VPC endpoints. Uh, eventually, they, uh, while actually they implement something similar for DynamoDB, eventually for practically all their services, they have started using the private link technology to provide um, interface type endpoints. And these endpoints are essentially network interfaces with private IP addresses and private DNS resolution that provide direct access to the various regional services from within the VPC. 
And if you want to see the list of these regional VPC endpoints in your AWS account, you just visit actually the VPC service on uh, the AWS console, and you click on the endpoints on the side pane, and for each endpoint, you can see which service corresponds to. So for example, in this particular example, we can see how an endpoint for S3 looks like. Now to create a VPC endpoint, it's quite simple. You just click on the create end button there in the console, and that will take you to a page where the default option for creating an endpoint is for an AWS service. Now, if you scroll down the page, you will see that uh, you know, the list of services that uh, you have. In this particular example, we have filtered up for S3, and you see the available options. Now, at the same time, uh, AWS has allowed also third parties um, to use private link and uh, define actually their own VPC endpoint services. So like that, a company can make um, a web service available to uh, their customers privately in their own VPCs. Um, and in this case, the customer just needs to type the name of the service, verify for them, that, that verify it's available for them in this AWS account and region. And if that is the case, the corresponding um, endpoint is created and attached to the specified VPC and, and subnets. So that is exactly what we have done. Right? We have created two VPC endpoint services, one for the secure cluster connectivity relay, and another one for the workspace REST APIs. And with this, in this way, actually, the customer can have the data plane and the control plane communicate only through private connections, that is, only using private IP addresses. Now you may ask, okay, um, how about what can we do actually now with the NAT gateway and the internet gateway? Can we, do we still need them? And the answer is that uh, unless you uh, use, actually, if you don't use the, uh, the default built-in uh, Databricks Metastore, but you use, for example, an external Metastore that is privately accessible from within your VPC, or use, for example, AWS Glue, or even better, Unity Catalog, from what we had this morning, right? Then you can drop, actually, this and eventually achieve a fully encapsulated, completely private data plane which has actually a simplified and cheaper networking configuration. So what about the connectivity to the front end, right? How do we make actually this uh, connection private? Now, first of all, uh, obviously the user should be accessing Databricks from some kind of an internal uh, network, right? And this network should be connected to a VPC that contains an endpoint for the Databricks REST API service. And moreover, you need to set up private DNS so that the URL corresponding to the workspace gets resolved into the private IP address of this VPC endpoint. And with this uh, configuration, now you can connect to the front end privately as well. But then how about actually the users that are still actually on the, on the public network, right? Are they allowed to access Databricks or not? And actually this is uh, something, this is a setting that you can specify when you could deploy actually your workspace. So while it is always a, a possible to access privately, you know, the, 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 the front end privately through the VPC endpoints, you may choose whether to allow or forbid access to the front end if the connections are not established actually from this, from a VPC endpoint. So let's see how you can deploy um, a private link enabled workspace. Now, for those of you who may have deployed uh, Databricks workspace on AWS in the past, you may be familiar actually with the Databricks account console, right? And this is actually where you can see the list of all your workspaces under, under, under your account. And for each workspace, you may see the corresponding you know, cloud resources that is using, and which are defined, you know, where else in, in, in cloud resources, right? And if you click into cloud resources, this will take you actually to a page where we have things like logical objects, like you know, credential configuration, storage configuration, network configuration, etc. So these cloud resource objects are essentially comprising the uh, workspace configuration, and they are simply references to the actual cloud resources on your AWS account. So for example, the credential configuration is simply a reference to the cross-account IAM role that is used by the control plane to launch the EC2 uh, instances on your VPC. The storage configuration refers simply to the uh, customer, um, to the custom, to, sorry, to the S3 bucket used actually for the for DBFS. The um, encryption keys refer actually to the customer managed keys defined on the KMS service of AWS that are used to encrypt uh, notebooks and disk volumes. And finally, the network configuration contains the information about which is the VPC and the private subnets 
that the cloud, uh, that the control plane actually should launch uh, the, the SPA clusters, and which is actually the security group that should attach actually to this um, EC2 instance and so when they launch. Now, in the case of private link, we have two types more, two, two more objects, right? Uh, one is the VPC endpoint configuration, which you know, are part actually of your network configuration, and they refer to the corresponding VPC endpoints on, uh, on AWS, on your VPC. And the second is the private access settings configuration, which practically says whether public access uh, to the front end is allowed or not, and moreover, which VPC endpoint specifically can access the Databricks uh, REST API and web app. So how do we set up actually these objects? Now, to set up a VPC endpoint, we need to perform operations both on the AWS and the Databricks side. And first, we first need, we need to, do, to create a, an endpoint on, um, on AWS by specifying the relevant name. And this is something you can do on the AWS console, as I have shown you before. So when you create it, you will see actually that the status of the endpoint appears as pending. And this is because, and this is why, as a next step, you need to invoke a Databricks account API to accept actually this request. But we're not yet over. We need to wait until the status of the VPC endpoint on the AWS side becomes active. And then we need to go back to the console and enable the private DNS for this endpoint. So we have actually this handshake operation that needs to take place. Now, setting up private connectivity to the front end is um, much simpler, I would say. You need to simply need to do call the API on Databricks to create actually the private access configuration object. And independently to that, you can set up private DNS resolution, for example, by using a private hosted zone on Route 53 on AWS. So now you can do all these things on the AWS console for the operations there, and then use a tool like Postman, for example, to invoke the uh, Databricks API. Now, of course, this may be okay for prototyping, right, for, uh, for experimenting, but eventually what you really want is to deploy your infrastructure as code, right, and therefore use tools like Terraform. And at Databricks, we have a team that has developed actually and maintains a Terraform provider, which you can access actually on registry.terraform.io. And there you will notice that there is a, a guide section, and then if you click and expand on it, then you will notice that there are instructions specific for private link. So if you access this, you will arrive into a page that contains all the instructions and scripts for setting up the resources on AWS and Databricks. And if you scroll down, you arrive at the part of the script that sets up the two VPC endpoints. And there are two things here that require some attention. The first one is the two variables for the VPC endpoint service names uh, for Databricks. So in the values for these variables, you can find our documentation on databricks.com where we describe all the steps needed to set a private link. And if you scroll down, you will find the names for the two, for the two services that you need to specify depending on the region you're deploying the workspace. By the way, these are the same, the service names that you need to type when you create the VPC endpoints on the AWS console, as I showed you before. Now, let's get back actually to our Terraform script. Now, and there's a second thing that you, you may need to pay attention to. So, there's a line that enables private DNS, which is initially commented out. And because of this handshake operation that I was just mentioned, you need to run the script twice, once actually with the line commented out, and then a second time with this line uncommented, so that like that you arrive to the final configuration, right, to where you want to be. Now, of course, you may ask actually, can, can we automate that? Can we fully automate this, right, this process? And here is actually where CloudFormation can be your friend. Now, CloudFormation allows you to define custom resources, which are essentially pieces of code that you can it can be executed as a Lambda functions when you create or you delete a resource. So what we have here is a piece of Python code which calls the AWS SDK to create the VPC endpoint, then makes the REST API call to the Databricks account API to, uh, to, to accept it. It waits until it becomes active again, and finally it calls the AWS SDK to enable private DNS for it. Now, the other advantage for cloud formation is that all the service names for the regional points are automatically picked up from a map so when you execute the template. So you don't need to look them up actually yourself in documentation or specify them actually as parameters. And this is exactly the approach that we have taken actually with a quick start. 
Now, the, which you can find, you know, Databricks, we have actually a quick start template actually under actually Amazon, AWS Amazon.com under this URL. And it provides you literally the fastest path to create um, um, a workspace with private link enabled. So if you scroll down actually this page, you will arrive into the how to deploy section where you have the links to the uh, CloudFormation templates. So you pick the relevant one, depending on whether or not actually you have access actually to IAM role creation. And then by clicking on that, your browser will bring you actually to the AWS console and the CloudFormation cloud formation service in particular with a template already uh, pre-selected. And then you pass actually to the step where you specify the various parameters such as Databricks credentials and other things. And there you will find actually uh, the new optional section that we have recently introduced that allows you to enable private link. So all you need to do is simply uh, select enable right here and you just execute the script. And within really a few minutes, you have all your AWS and Databricks resources set up and a brand new workspace that is up and running. Now, by default, the Quick Start template allows a public connectivity to the front end of the workspace that it deploys, right? But if you want to set up private connectivity as well, the only you need to do is simply download the, the, uh, the template and slightly modify it in, in literally a couple of lines, right? So let's assume, for example, that I have done that. So I have set up actually a workspace with uh, also private access to the, uh, to the front end. So let's test it. So how can we test it? So here I'm using my computer connected to uh, the public network, right? So I'm using my computer from home, right? So in order to be able to access the workspace, the first thing I need is a VPC that, is, uh, that has actually an endpoint, you know, VPC endpoint attached to it, and a bastion host, that is a server with a public IP address that allows incoming connections only on port 22, that is the SSH port, right? So, and when I, this way, I can, do, I can set up an SSH tunnel actually using this command. In this particular example, you can see I'm using uh, port 9090 on my, on my computer. And now, in principle, I can access the workspace privately through the VPC endpoint by routing HTTPS traffic through the SSH tunnel. Now, how can I do it on my browser? So in order to do that, I need to configure it. So I, here I'm using the example of Firefox. So I go to network settings to set up a proxy configuration. And here's actually where I need to specify port 9090, which corresponds to my SSH tunnel. And I also make, need to make sure that I have checked proxy DNS using SOX version five. So now I'm going to attempt to, to connect to my workspace, but first I will not do it with Firefox, but with a different browser, which has actually the default settings. So then if I visit the URL of my, my workspace, that will bring me to the login screen, but then I will here I will receive an error, and this error informs me that I'm not allowed to access the workspace from my current network. And this is exactly the behavior I'm expecting. Because now if I go and do the, exactly the same thing with uh, Firefox, which I have configured to use the SSH tunnel, now I arrive actually to the workspace that I have set up and created, and now I can start using Databricks in its full glory and completely privately. And with that, I pass the floor to Hemal, right, who will talk to you about the really exciting stuff. So, what do you hear one? This way. <laughs> Not done. For sharing detailed insights on private link architecture as well as deployment automation to set up private link workspaces. Today, I'm going to be talking about a sneak peek of some of the exciting features we are delivering in the upcoming months as well as the roadmap for AWS private link. The key theme here is to simplify the overall customer journey to configure private link workspaces as well as reduce the overall setup time. So one of the common customer requests we get is to convert their existing E2 workspace running production workloads into a private link enabled workspace. Customers want to use private link for enhancing security of their workspace as well as simplifying the network between their on-prem network and Databricks. Uh, so excited to announce that we'll be providing support for customers to self-serve updating their existing workspaces from non-private link to private link via AD like existing Databricks APIs as well as account console. So 
So when you actually enable private link for your workspaces, uh, you can actually configure your uh, private connectivity for both front-end and back-end through self-serve APIs, so that's a big win. Um, uh, next up, uh, as uh, customers' workload in the cloud increases for more analytics workload, there's increasing need to scale up the Spark clusters in the data plane. Many customers that use private link have configured their customer-defined VPCs, which requires customers to then go to their AWS console and then expand their subnet and CIDR range. Then they have to file a Databricks support ticket to then attach the new subnet or network configuration to the existing workspace, requiring a lot of back and forth. We are actually providing ability for customers now to self-serve network updates through the existing workspace update APIs as well as account console. So that's another exciting feature that we are launching. So now, with this ability, customers can basically uh, scale up their Spark clusters and thereby allow increasing workload to be set up. This also enables customers to uh, do many other common network configuration steps, such as you want to update your security groups, you want to basically uh, change your VPC endpoints, you can do everything with this new update. So uh, another exciting feature um, on the theme of simplifying user journeys to set up private link workspaces, we are now enabling ability for customers to actually create private link workspaces directly through the account console. So uh, with the account console, now you can actually set up private-only access for both front-end and back-end to your workspaces. Using private connectivity settings, you can actually configure which AWS VPC endpoints can talk to your Databricks REST APIs and web app. Moreover, you can also configure the access control on your workspaces to allow access from only the configured VPC endpoints under your Databricks account, or even a specific VPC endpoint for that specific workspace, giving you additional controls. Uh, in addition, we are providing ability for customers to set up hybrid workspaces, which allow a combination of private access as well as public access, which many customers use for integrating with uh, SaaS services like Tableau, Power BI. So all of that is available via the account console. So we hope this will really, really simplify the overall journey for setting up private link workspaces. And there's more. So uh, as the customers use more and more SaaS services like Tableau, Power BI for doing interactive data analysis, there is increasingly a need for private link to work with such scenarios. Currently, for workspaces which have front-end private connectivity enabled, when a SaaS service like Tableau tries to connect to Databricks, the connection is rejected because it's not coming over the configured private endpoint. So what many customers end up doing is they actually configure hybrid access on their workspaces, thereby enabling public access, and then they use that in combination with IP ACLs to restrict public access only from the SaaS services IPs, thereby allowing like, the SaaS services to access Databricks. Uh, moreover, in addition to that, the combination of private link and uh, SaaS services requires customers to basically allow list their data plane VPC IPs, as well as their transit VPC IPs to be part of the IP ACL allow list, uh, creating extra steps and more configurations. Uh, clearly, this is not ideal. So we are working on providing ability for customers to set up IP ACL and private link on the same workspace. We do this by basically validating your private traffic only over the private endpoint you have configured, and then we validate your public traffic over the IP ACLs you have configured. So this allows customers to not have separate setups for data plane, uh, private endpoints, and VPCs. It's all like just configure what you need for public IPs and what you need for uh, private endpoints. It actually simplifies the setup for customers and helps them uh, to do even more uh, simpler automation. Uh, uh, next up, uh, uh, continuing on the theme of simplifying the onboarding process, we just went to the diagram is on slide. So currently, when customers set up a private link workspace, first they have to create a VPC endpoint on AWS side. Uh, then they basically require to register to Databricks to accept the connection on our endpoint service. Finally, 
they have to then enable private DNS again by going on the AWS side. So it's a back and forth between AWS, Databricks, and AWS, and not ideal. Uh, we are working on an ability to accept your VPC endpoint in an enabled state by auto accepting the connection to Databricks endpoint service. So previously, those two steps of you first creating VPC endpoint and then configuring private DNS, that can be collapsed into the same step because the endpoint is already enabled. Therefore, you can actually enable private DNS directly on that. And then, of course, you register the endpoint to Databricks so that we can validate it against our, uh, our private traffic. Uh, this also allows customers to uh, simplify the deployment automation using tools such as Terraform as well as CloudFormation. So really, really excited about this feature to help simplify the overall uh, user journeys. Uh, next up, I'll be talking about the upcoming roadmap for uh, AWS private link features. So currently, we are in a gated public preview state. Uh, many of you are already leveraging private link for many of your production workloads. Uh, of course, you need to file a customer support ticket to enable private link on your account. Not ideal. So as a first step, we are working on supporting many of the above features that I just mentioned plus the fully ungated public preview to be available by October of this year. So really excited for you guys to try it out without any sort of restrictions. And finally, we are super excited to announce that we'll be looking into a GA of AWS private link by end of this calendar year here. So hopefully that will really, really open up many more production workloads and scenarios on private link. Um, we are really excited about you folks trying out private link and send us feedback, especially on the new features that we are building. Uh, we also uh, would love to kind of understand your use cases, uh, where are you using private link, for what use cases. So feel free to talk with us after this talk. We'll be happy to learn more about your scenarios. And uh, with that, uh, we are here to ask and answer any questions that you may have. Any question for Himal or Jonas? So, Don't be shy. Sure. Yep. Question for you is, and maybe kind of elementary for this level. I need to change. Okay, first off, we're early in our Databricks journey, and enterprise wide Fortune 500 company. Um, hardest part about deploying Databricks in our organization is security. Cloud engineering says, hey, it's not AWS, we're not gonna touch it. And so it's been this back and forth battle internally. So we set up a da Databricks VPC in the middle of our lake house journey and we get a ransomware attack and we need to change the VPC. So I was told that cannot be done without rebuilding the entire workspace. So. Did I hear you correctly that you said that we can change the VPC now or will be soon without mm -hmm. having to rebuild the complete workspace? Yes, exactly the feature that we are working on basically, ability to um, configure your VPC uh, with the different subnet CIDR range as your Spark workload increases, you should be able to do it in place without having the need to create a new workspace. When will that be available? Uh, that we're targeting brief. October of this year. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other question? Yep. Should private link be the default way of deploying on AWS? Sorry, Should we be deploying workspaces on AWS with private link enabled by default? Uh, uh, in, are there any downsides to it? You mean automatically enable private link enabled workspaces? Yeah. You know, there's no downside. There's, of course, uh, some cloud resources that you have to set up, like the private endpoints and stuff. They might have some cost implications, but other than that, uh, from a security perspective, there's definitely no downsides there. Thank you. Uh, another aspect of uh, security that sort of, I, know, I understand private, private link here, but the next one that I've had with dis in discussions with security is, you know, among the worker nodes and communication, that should be also be encrypted between the, um, in the, within the Spark cluster. Is there any, any, any call 
with private link, it's like in theory, it's a private private connection, and encryption shouldn't need to be there. But because of uh, compliance policies, it's, it says that it should be encrypted. Um, yep, that's a great. Yeah. Yep, that's a great question. So yeah, we are working in uh, looking into what it needs. So we have this feature called CMK or customer managed keys, which many customers use to encrypt their data on Databricks, including managed services, their managed disks, the EBS volumes, uh, DBFS. Uh, one of the uh, requests there is to actually provide uh, inter-node encryption for Spark clusters. I think exactly what you are referring to. Yeah. Uh, we are currently evaluating the feature request in terms of how to best enable that. But yeah, stay tuned for that. We'll have some more information on that. Right. Please go ahead. So I just wanted to point out. So you could use Nitro instances today along with private links, so that would encrypt communication across the worker nodes. So, And then you can set up a uh, cluster policy as well to make sure that everybody kind of launched these clusters using those Nitro instances. You can take a last one if you want. Anyone? No? Thank you again, Amelan.